Greetings, friends. In this video, we will continue the topic of discrete logic chips. I will share my experience of creating a clock using Coma Logic based on my own design. It will include problems and their solutions. But in the end, everything will work. The schematic, along with all useful files for this project, will be in the video description. This project was born a few months ago when I couldn't sleep and decided to spend some time in a simulator, tinkering with logic chips. You know, there's a popular saying, whatever you do with Arduino, it turns into a clock. So essentially, my little project quickly turned into a clock. Then I remembered that I have a small stock of ALS 318 indicators, which I wanted to put to use. At that time, I wasn't thinking about the existence of specialized chips. From the 176 series for building clocks, I was overtaken by excitement. And after a few hours, I had the first working prototype in the simulator. Let's first take a look at the structural diagram of the clock. Essentially, a clock is a slightly complex counter. A signal with a frequency of 1 Hz will be fed into the counter chain. The first two parts are counters for 60, counting seconds and minutes. Then there's the counter for 24, counting hours. The ALS318 indicator is a combined 9-digit 7-segment display. That is, the segment lines of all the digits are parallel. This means that to display time on this indicator, dynamic indication must be used. In other words, set the required combination on the segments, activate the first indicator, turn it off, set the next combination, activate the second digit, and so on, in an endless cycle. And due to the inertia of our vision, we won't see these switches. Therefore, we have a dynamic indication block here, which will require its own separate clock signal. Also, we should not forget about the information input block, which will allow us to set the time when power is supplied. We will look at the final schematic closer to the end of the video, because I made a couple of mistakes and oversights in the initial schematic, which I used to design the printed circuit board on the stream and ordered them to be manufactured at the factory. Later on the stream, I completely soldered one board, turned it on, and it didn't work properly. At the same time, one of the chips, specifically the buffer inverter, was getting very hot. Of course, when drawing the schematic, I didn't consider that there are people who place the power supply symbol with the positive at the bottom and the ground at the top. In short, the pins were lifted to correctly supply power to the chip. Additionally, I added a small capacitor to it, and the clock came to life. Everything started ticking and blinking just the way I wanted. So, make sure to carefully check the components during development. However, the clock didn't want to respond to button presses at all. And I went to look at the schematic that I had put together here. Let's start with the seconds reset circuit. Using this and gate, a high level is generated to reset the counter when 60 seconds are reached. The button is implemented using a classic debouncing circuit, and after the Schmidt trigger, a high pulse is generated, which is sent to the reset line through a resistor. However, I didn't take into account that the low level maintained by the output of the end gate prevents the high level from resetting the counters through the resistor. We add a diode to the circuit, and now the end gate will only affect the reset input with a high level, while by default, the reset line will be pulled to ground through the output of the Schmidt trigger and a resistor. We've sorted out the second button. It simply resets the seconds. The minute and hour buttons, essentially, should provide counting pulses to set the time. Since the circuits are similar, let's consider the minute one. Initially, how did I do it? The button is also connected through a Schmidt trigger, then through a resistor to the clock input, and an inverter is connected there as well. And again, just like in the seconds reset circuit, a low level at the inverter's output prevents us from making adjustments. But here, an additional problem arises, because the signal at the inverter's output is taken from the seventh digit. Each counter in my circuit counts up to 10. That is, when cascading, a 1 appears on this pin when the counter counts up to 40. And this 1 will remain there until the counter resets after counting to 60. At this moment, the level at the inverter's output will change from low to high, creating an edge. That will trigger the next counter to count this cycle. That is, the next counter in the circuit responds specifically to the signal edge, not the level. My first thought was to add an RC circuit and a diode. At this point, after the capacitor, the level changes will form short pulses. Since we are only interested in the positive pulse, we add a diode, and everything works. And this circuit really worked. The clock started responding to the pressing of the minute and hour setting buttons, and I left everything for testing. And after a couple of hours, I noticed that although the seconds were not lagging, the clock had counted several extra minutes. So, I had to think further. One could blame interference in the circuit, but Comer is not TTL logic, and there are no strong pulse interferences in the circuit. Moreover, the number of filtering capacitors is sufficient. So, I started reading datasheets. 
and upon opening the datasheet for the CD4518, which is a counter, I noticed a parameter like the maximum rise and fall time of the clock signal. There it is. Indeed, in my circuit, the pulse has an exponential decay, which sometimes causes the counter to trigger twice. The problem was identified. Now, how to solve it? After carefully weighing all the pros and cons, I decided to make it as reliable as possible. So, I redesigned the logic for the minute and hour setting buttons. Now, they will supply high voltage, and I routed the signal from the diode to the input of a Schmidt trigger. The exponential decay was replaced with a clear pulse. Well, during further testing, no errors were observed in the clock's operation. Now, let's take a look at the entire final clock circuit. So, why? Are there so many microchips? Here, as you already understood, we have counters set to 10, the first two together. Count up to 60, as do the second two, the third pair of counters. Count up to 24. Then the signals from the counters are sent to the CD4503 buffers. The feature of these microchips is that six buffers are divided into two groups of four and two inputs. We can disable them by switching to the high Z state from the circuit. For this, there are two enable inputs. That's why there are several microchips of such buffers are connected in such a way that the output groups of four contacts are connected in parallel, and the enable inputs are connected to a decoder, which is connected to the counter of the dynamic display clock generator. This means that for each cycle of dynamic display, only one of the time counters outputs its value, which goes into a special decoder for forming seven segment numbers. Then I wanted to create blinking separators between the digits, so I added two more CD4019 microchips. The A inputs in it are connected to the lines of the seven segment decoder and to the B outputs, I will connect only one segment. But in fact, you can set any combination here and light up other segments and the switching signal digit or symbol is obtained on the same decoder of the dynamic display. So digit, digit, symbol, digit, digit, symbol, digit, digit. And in familiar places, the indicator is switched by another decoder of the dynamic counter display. The frequency of the dynamic display can be changed by adjusting this capacitor and resistor, a classic Schmidt trigger generator circuit. In one of the videos, we talked about such generators, and the heart of the clock is a clock generator at the frequency of 1 Hz, which is assembled on the K176E5 microchip with quartz stabilization. In this circuit, this capacitor is adjustable. Personally, I adjusted it by connecting an oscilloscope to the 11th pin of the microchip. It should have a frequency of 32,768 Hz, and we turn the capacitor until we achieve the desired frequency. That's about it for the circuit. I printed a stand on a 3D printer, solder, the power supply cords, connected everything and it all works. Consumption. Since in this project, I use complementary metal oxide semiconductor logic chips, or CMOS, the, the consumption was only 11 to 13 milliamps. Personally, when assembling this project, I use sockets for all the chips, which I also recommend to you. CMOS logic chips are quite sensitive to static and can easily fail under overloads. With sockets, you have the ability to quickly replace them. The ILS318 display is really cool, but to be honest, it has very poor viewing angles, which I understood from the very beginning. However, the project brought me a lot of emotions. I will gladly put it on the table and let the clock tick. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, don't forget about likes, comments, and subscribe to the channel. And if you're interested in the topic of making clocks with discrete logic, then write about it in the comments. I have a few more insanely cool ideas on this matter. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. This was Andre with you. Bye.